All right, so tonight we're going to talk about performance classes. So, let's see if this is going to work. There we go. So, here's a recap of what we talked about for halter classes. We talked about the three main types of halter classes that being your stock type, like your quarter horses, your hunter types, like your thoroughbreds and your warm bloods, and your saddle horse types, like your saddlebreds, Tennessee walkers, and like any gated sort of horses. Um, we talked about st how structural correctness is important in halter classes because of their skeletal form helping their potential function, which would be what we we're talking about tonight with our under saddle classes. Um, we talked about how halter classes are based off of confirmation and how you should be able to describe both positive and negative points of the horses when you're taking notes and writing reasons, that you should be brief and not too wordy while writing reasons. That way you can remember things, but be concise, but be concise and, directly and directly describe, describe what's, what's going, going on in the class, the class. like confirmation, like faults. confirmation faults. And then that you and should start from the head and proceed the down the back to the hind quarters the when, you're when you're giving your reasons. So what are performance classes? Performance classes are under saddle classes where you're judging on the horse's ability to perform while being written. When you're judging them, you're judging them as seen, but not as sound. So when you're judging a halter class, you're assuming that they're sound, but you're just judging them on their confirmation faults. Whereas in a performance class, you're judging them on how they're being seen. Like if you see a confirmation issue, like an unsoundness, you're going to automatically place them at the bottom of the class. So you're looking for different things, like if they're bobbing their head, if they're stumbling a bit, those are things that would lead to an unsoundness, which would make you want to put your horse at the bottom of the class. So there's different types of performance classes. You mainly have your pleasure classes and then your equitation classes. So your pleasure classes are based on the horse and how the horse is moving, whereas your equitation, horsemanship, those kind of classes are judged on the rider. So in contests, we've had a combination of both classes judged on the horse and on the rider. So I'm covering both of those different types tonight. So that way you kind of have an idea of how they should each be judged. And at the bottom, I just put a couple like common abbreviations that we use. So Western Pleasure, we do WP, HUS is Hunter Under Saddle, HSE, Hunt Seat Equitation, Ranch Riding, etc. So... First, we're going to go over the different types of Western classes. So our first most common Western class is Western Pleasure. You're doing the gates of a walk, jog, extended jog, and lope primarily in these classes. And you want to have distinction between each gate. So your walk is your typical four-beat gait. It should be flat-footed, but alert. You know, they still should be covering ground, but they shouldn't be super sluggish and moving very slowly. Um, your jog needs to be two beat and diagonal, and you want it to be square and balanced. There still be, should be able to cover some stride and move out, but you don't want them to be super excessively fast. When you extend the jog, it shouldn't be faster, but it should be more forward. The horse should still be able to move slowly with cadence and not have a very super choppy stride. So I define like cadence and impulsion, which you can use when describing horses and your reasons. Oh knitting lacy. Um, so your cadence and impulsion is how much power and force that the horse has behind them that allows them to collect more by using their hind end. So when they're extending they should be moving with more cadence and more pulsion in their hind end as opposed to just moving really fast and really choppy and try to extend as much as they can but they can't extend. Um, their lope should be rhythmical and should have a three beat gait and it should be relaxed, smooth, and again ground covering. Um, faults when you're judging Western Pleasure, you would fault a horse if they have excessive speed, if they're four beating at the loop, which would be when you're trying to make them loop, they have an actual, they actually have four beats to their gait as opposed to a three beat gait. Um, that used to be really popular in quarter horses a few years ago, where they would have a lot of horses four beating, and now it's kind of been weeded out, whereas they're not doing that gait anymore because it's very undesirable. It makes the horse look really lame. They're really stiff in the hind end when they move, and it's just not desirable. So you would fault the horse if they're four beating. Um, if the horse has too high or too low of a head carriage is a fault. So the horse on the right here has a very typical 
ideal Western pleasure headset if they're too high in their head carriage where if their head was sticking up they would often be like resisting to the bit and they're not using their hind end properly but you also don't want their head to be too low so normally they say that the tip of the ears should be at the um, top of the withers if they have too low of a headset and they're dragging the ground they're also not using their hind end correctly and they're just kind of dragging on the bit um, in western pleasure although it's known for having a more slow gait you also don't want them to be excessively slow, otherwise they're losing their forward momentum and they're not moving with that impulsion and they're not covering the ground that they need to be. Uh, come on. Um, next is Western horsemanship. So this is the opposite of pleasure as if, because it's judged on the rider's ability to work with the horse. Um, most often your Western horsemanship class, if you're judging it, it'll, you will have a pattern that you're given and you have to judge the rider performing the pattern. It's often you start at a walk, you go to a jog, you do a circle at a jog or a circle at a lope. You lope to, in a straight line or something by changing lead and then you back. That's a typical horsemanship pattern that you would have to judge. Um, so you're judging on the rider's position primarily. So you want the, the rider's ear to line up with their shoulder, to line up with their hip, to their heel, and you want them to be flat and relaxed in the back. Um, you also want them, their rein hand and their free arm should both be bent at the elbow and you should carry them above and in front of the horn. So kind of like you're riding English, but you're, because it's Western, you're riding with only one hand. So typically in horsemanship, you want your free arm to be in the same way. Um, your faults in horsemanship would be you allowing the horse to break gait, excessively spurring your horse. Um, if you're doing a pattern and you have to turn, if you turn more than the turn is requiring, like if they require you to turn 180 degrees a certain way, if you don't turn enough or if you turn too much, you can be faulted. Um, if you're looking down at your horse, trying to touch your horse, grab the horse with the saddle, or looking down to check your leads, that you can be faulted for. And if you're missing leads, like if they ask for the lope, like on the left lead and you do the right lead, that you would be faulted for. Um, disqualifications in horsemanship would be if you're doing the pattern, if you go off pattern, say you miss a circle, um, if you work on the wrong side of the cones, when you look at the pattern, there's a specific side of the cones that you should be moving on. And if you say you're supposed to be doing the pattern all on the left side of the cone, if you do it on the right side of the cone and cross over, you'll be disqualified for being off pattern. Um, obviously, if you fall off the horse, you'd be disqualified. And if you use two hands on the reins because it's a horsemanship class, you can be disqualified. So these are all things that you should be looking for in the rider when they're doing the class to judge them. Because if you see them switch hands or use both reins, you would have to pin that rider below other riders that may say just broke gait. Now, just because a rider would technically be disqualified in the class does not mean that they're disqualified from your reasons. Like say you're like, you have a class of, oh, it's a class of four and say one of the four is disqualified. You don't just judge the, you don't just give a score for like the first three. You have to include the fourth horse or rider and just say that like they placed last because they would have been disqualified for doing this. Or if you have multiple disqualifications, you have to based off of how severe the disqualification is. So a person who, say, went off pattern would be placed lower than a person who used two, two hands because if you went off pattern, you defeated the purpose of the class, so you would have to be placed lower. Um, reining is also a Western pattern class. This is judged solely on the horse's um, ability to be willingly guided and controlled through the different maneuvers. Um, they have to be smooth, finessed, and quick and authoritative, and you have to be able to control the speed of the horse easily. Um, in reining, they're doing different things such as like circles, rollbacks, sliding stops, like pictured. They're spinning, and you're often judging reining on a point system. So there is a point like score sheet that you can use, but I find it very difficult to try to use it during a judging contest. So unless you want that I can provide it for you but otherwise I kind of just make note of what they do and try to judge how good or bad it is. 
So normally like a typical reigning score, like they start at 70 and you can either go up on how well you do or you can go down based on how bad. So different things that they would deduct for would be if the horse was bucking or rearing, if they broke gate, if they'd stopped before a certain marker, like if you're supposed to start your rollback or your spin at one certain spot, if you go past it, you would be deducted a few points. If you break gate, if you spin under or over the amount that you're supposed to spin, up to one fourth of a turn, that would be a deduction. And if you miss a lead change, you can also be deducted. Um, a disqualification in reining would be if the horse went off pattern, if the rider used two hands or switched hands, if you overspin the horse more than one fourth of a turn, or if you do any sort of maneuvers that aren't required of the pattern, if you refuse to do part of the pattern, or if you fall. So in reining, you often have to watch both the horse and you also want to watch the rider. Because when I went to nationals, we watched a reining class and the majority of the contestants, we placed the class wrong because a lot of us did not notice that the, one of the riders switched hands in the middle of the reining pattern. So reining, although it's judged on the horse, you have to both look at the horse and the rider as much as possible. Uh, Western riding, this is a less common class now that we're not doing it in 4-H anymore, but it's still listed as a class that we can possibly be judging. So Western riding is a pattern class. Uh, this is an example of a common pattern that they use in Western riding. It's very similar to reining, except that there's cones that you have to weave around and a log that you have to go over involved. Um, so it's judging, the, the horses often judge on the quality of their gates, how able or how they're able to do lead changes, specifically flying lead changes at the loop, and how responsive they are to a rider's aids to be able to weave and make the turns and the lead changes. Um, different faults that you can have in western riding include um, hitting or ticking the log, if you break gate, if the lead changes aren't simultaneous, meaning the horse doesn't immediately switch their leads in both the front end and the hind legs, and then having too many lead changes or doing simple changes where you allow the horse to go down to a trot in order to change their lead. However, if the horse goes down to a trot to do a simple lead change more than four times, that's a considered disqualification, along with being off course, refusing to do part of the thing, or going off pattern, or being disobedient, or failing to change your leads. Um, we also have ranch riding. I, they just started having us judge ranch riding last year in the contest because it has been recently added to 4-H. So ranch riding and ranch pleasure are very similar to the styles of like reining and western riding. Um, you would judge the pleasure, the ranch pleasure class almost opposite of, west, of normal western pleasure because you want these horses to be quicker and more forward. Um, so AQHA describes their classes as the horse showing individually in pattern work and being pre precise in their maneuvers in the patterns. Um, and you basically, the horses are meant to be working on a ranch, herding cattle, herding sheep, whatever they're doing. So they want them to be more quick and more responsive to a rider's aids. So often they're shown cleaner. There's like no bling, no silver on either the riders or the horses. They often aren't clipped and they don't have fake tails. And those are kind of things that like if you, apparently if you show ranch, you can just get disqualified if you have that excessive bling or fake stuff because they want such a natural plain look. But basically in ranch riding, you're kind of judging it, like I said, the opposite of Western pleasure. So you want the horses to be more forward, more quicker. So they're often doing lots of transitions in the classes and in the patterns to show how quick they are and how accurate they're able to do them, but also being smooth and balanced as any horse should be. So any questions on the Western classes before I moved on to English classes? Okay. So now we're gonna move on to English classes. So for English classes, we have classes such as Hunter Under Saddle, 
Um, this is judged on the horse. It's judged on their suitability for their purpose. So hunter under saddle, the hunter horses are often meant to be horses out fox hunting, working in a punt field. They should be able to do long distances and the long hours of doing those distances. So that's kind of how they're suitable for their purpose. So they're often judged at the walk, the trot, the extended trot, the canter, and sometimes a hand gallop, which is a collected gallop sort of thing. You want these horses to have smooth, long ground covering strides. They should be able to respond willingly to the rider's late, very light leg and hand contact, but they should also appear bright and ex expressive. Um, so faults in judging hunter under saddle would be having a wrong lead, the horse breaking gait, that them having too high of a head carriage or too low of a head carriage. Like on the right, my horse, my standard red, she has way too high of a head carriage for a hunter under saddle horse. Um, if a hunter under saddle horse is excessively slow, they can be faulted because you want them to kind of be more forward moving than your Western pleasure horses. And if they kind of overflex or nose out, resisting the bit, that's also a fault. And sometimes when you're judging, the class might specify that it's a USEF or a hunter, like a USEF hunter under saddle or USEF hunter type. And that typically you're judging your thoroughbreds or sport horses as compared to judging hunter under saddle quarter horses. So just keep that in mind. Like if you're talking about your structural correctness, and giving reasons because you don't want to be describing a quarter horse when you actually were judging thoroughbreds in the class. So, yeah. Um, next, not as common for doing judging other than the fact that we are judging videos, so it is a possibility, um, is hunter hack. So hunter hack, you're judging it in the same style as hunter under saddle. You want the horses to have long, low, ground covering strides. However, 70% of your class is judged on the two fences that the horses will jump, whereas 30% is on the rail work. So you want to take more priority in the fences. If a horse like refused the fence or just didn't do a very good job in the fence work, but they did really great on the rail, that's not going to place them over a horse that did great on the fence and kind of bad on the rail. So faults for judging hunter hack would be if the horse breaks gate, if they carry their head too high, if they're super fast or super slow, they have wrong leads, nosing out, the same kind of concept as hunt under saddle. However, however, you have to put in account refusals. So when you disqualify a horse from hunter hack, they have to be on their third refusal, run out, stop, or if you have to put an extra circle in front of a fence. So say there's two fences, it takes the horse like three tries to get over those two fences. And then say another horse refuses twice or runs out twice but gets over the fences in four tries. The horse that had three refusals would be placed higher than the horse that had four. Kind of like common sense, like took them, it took them less time to get over the fences than the other one did. So other disqualifications would also be bolting from the arena if the horse went off course, if they jumped the jumps in the wrong direction. And then also between horses, they often have to reset the jumps. If they jump the jumps before they're allowed to, if they're, before they're told to jump the course, and before the course is reset, then that would also be a thing for disqualification. Then we have hunt seat equitation. This is specifically on the flat because there is hunt seat equitation over fences, but you wouldn't be judging that for a judging class. So this is specifically on the hunter rider as opposed to the hunter horse. So you're judging it on the rider's ability to be able to subtly, subtly cue and aid the horse effectively. It kind of shows that if they are be able to ride well in the flat, that they can eventually progress to judge, jumping over fences in classes. There is sometime a pat, sometimes a pattern in hunt seat equitation as there is in horsemanship but it's not as common to judge a pattern class for hunt seat deck. Um, so you're judging that. So like the gates before, it was like the walk, the extended trot, the extended trot, the trot, the canter. So hunt seat deck, you're also looking often for the, how well they, a rider performs at the posting trot as opposed to the sitting trot, how well they can halt their horse, how well they can back their horse. So the rider's position is often very similar to that of Western horsemanship where your ears should line up with your shoulder to your hip, to your heel, et cetera. 
Um, but you want the English riders should have their hands in front of the horse's withers and over their withers. And you should be able to draw a straight line from the bit of the, or the horse's mouth to the rider's elbows because they should also have their elbows bent and back a little bit. You should be able to look up with your eyes, have your shoulders back, have your heels slightly down. And different faults that you can have in hunt seat equitation would be losing your irons or your reins if you don't have enough contact with the bit. So if your reins are really long and loopy, it shows that you don't really have much control of the horse, so that would fault you. Also, even if you had too much contact with the horse's mouth and the horse was resisting your contact, um, if you grab the saddle, if you touch the horse, or if you crop or spur the horse in front of their shoulder, those would all be faults. And disqualification obviously would be falling off. So then you have English pleasure and pleasure driving. These, we've, in my time of judging, I've never had to judge a driving class, but it is on the catalog for this year that there's a possibility we can be judging a driving class. So I kind of wanted to discuss that a little bit just in case it does come up. So for kind of English pleasure, pleasure driving, the horses should be able to carry themselves like naturally and balanced as if they were riding, but you'd put a harness and a cart on them. So they should still be able to move straight and freely, have good manners while in the cart and very bright of an expression. Their gates are a little different. They can't exactly canter with the cart behind them, or at least not safely. So they're judged on the walk, the park gate, and the road gate. The park gate is your traditional trot, and your road gate is the more extended trot. And when you give reasons or you judge them, you would use the same terminology as like your hunter under saddle or your saddle seat classes, depending on the breed of the horse that you're judging, except your reins are the same thing as your lines of the harness. And instead of a rider, you're talking about a driver. So in the top picture is the example of a saddle bread driving and your bottom picture is the example of like a quarter horse driving. Both of those are okay. For the saddle bread, it's okay for their head to be high because that's how their breed is. They have a high head carriage. And then for the horse at the bottom, that's how like a quarter horse moves. So those are both acceptable for both those horses. It just depends on what horse breed you're judging in harness, which one you would be, like how you would phrase everything. So then we finally have your saddle seat classes and your kind of walking horse classes. These are a little funky. I personally am not good at judging them only because they are gated. Um, but when you're judging these horses, you want to look for them having a good steady rhythm, having flexion to their knees and their hocks, being bold about it. They have a lot of animation to their stride. They often appear more upright in their frame and they're more vertical in their head and they move very lightly, but also they are like snappy about their gates. They're very quick into getting them. So on the left is a saddle bread. And when you're judging the classes, you have to pay attention often as to whether it's a three gated or five gated saddle bread. You're three gated, you're basically judging it like a normal, a normal class. So you're only looking for the walk, trot and canter. But as a five gated class, like five gated, like country pleasure, say the class might be called. You're looking for the walk, the trot, the canter, the rack, and the slow gate. So, because there's five specific gates, your rack, your slow gate, and your walk are all four beat gates. Only your rack is very fast, and your slow gate is more collected and slower than the rack. So, basically, my advice for judging that sort of class is that if they ask for all five gates, make sure there's distinction to each gate. Like, make sure that their rack isn't the same thing as the trot, like they should have a four beat gate as opposed to a two beat gate. And make sure their slow gate isn't the same thing as their walk. And just like make sure that there's a difference between each of those gates. Because then if you have a horse that kind of has a rack that looks very similar to their trot and their slow gate, you can't really tell if it's a walk or a slow gate, then that would put them down as opposed to a horse that you can distinctly tell what each gate is. Um, the horse on the right is a Tennessee walker. They move a little bit different than your saddlebreds. They have three different 
skates. They have the walk, the running walk and the pace. Their pace is a diagonal, no, lateral movement where their front, your front leg and your hind leg on the same side move together. So their pace is like that. And their running walk is just a very fast version of the walk. When you're judging Tennessee walkers, they often might look lame because their running walk, they have a lot of head bob to them. That is normal. With Tennessee walkers, you almost want them to have more head bob than less just because of the way they move. So if you see them doing that, don't freak out. Don't be like, oh my God, they're lame. I have to put them at the bottom of the class. That's how the Tennessee walkers are supposed to move. And again, with them, you want distinction in their gates. You want their running walk to be more running. You want their pace to be a pace and you want their walk to be slow, collected and flat footed. So I think that's all I have for you guys tonight. Um, I could pull up classes or pull up videos of the classes. So if you guys wanted to see them in the next half, otherwise this is all I have for you guys. Um, do you guys have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So you said on one of the slides, I think it was this one, that the horse, you have to like be able to tell it's doing a slow gait and a walk. What's the difference? Their slow gait is more forward than a walk, but it's not exactly a rack. So I can probably pull up a video for you if you want, or I can send you one. Their rack is like really, really fast, but they still have four distinct footfalls, whereas their slow gait is like more collected. The slow gait is kind of like a middle between like a walk and a trot. It's like an extended walk for a saddlebred, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Does anyone else have any questions? No, I'm going to stop recording.